I'm Dr. Tejaswini Patel, a consultant uh, neurotologist practicing in Narayana Health City, Bangalore. And today I'll be talking about the electrolyte abnormalities or electrolyte imbalances and its relation to balance disorder. A small disclaimer in red before I begin the topic. I am not going to talk about the electrolyte abnormalities in the inner ear fluids, okay? But I am going to make it big and talk about the electrolyte imbalances in the whole total body volume itself. But why? Why do we have to talk about this? Why do we need to include electrolyte abnormalities in our talk? Because it is time that we go beyond. It is time we go beyond the labyrinth and explore other causes of imbalance. To explore when the patient presents to us with complaints of imbalance, lightheadedness, dizziness, heavy-headedness, and vertigo, to be able to differentiate between each symptom, to be able to analyze what is the meaning of each symptom, because each symptom tells a different story. Each symptom directs towards a different pathology and a different system altogether. So it is the need of the R to adapt a holistic or a multidisciplinary approach towards the management of vertigo. We might treat them, we might not treat them, but it is necessary to be aware. It is necessary to make a diagnosis and then make a required referrals to other disciplinaries so that the patient is treated well and effectively. A so, so, so a small step towards that is today's presentation, that is electrolyte abnormality. So what is an electrolyte? As the name suggests, electrolyte is a substance that conducts electricity. And when, when it dissolves in water, it gets uh, charged called ions, positive or negative. So it gets the ability to travel across the cell membranes, travel across the tissues, organs, and thereby performing a number of bodily functions. So some of the electrolytes are sodium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. And each electrolyte has a specific function to perform. It has been assigned with a specific function, like for example, sodium deals with water regulation, acid-base balance, and potassium deals with muscle activity and others, and so on and so forth. So, when there is any abnormality involving these electrolytes, either decrease or increase, they may present with various symptoms involving either neurological, gastrointestinal, or musculoskeletal. So, depending upon the symptoms itself, we can categorize whether it is hypo or hypernatremia, calcemia, kalemia, or magnesemia, okay? But today, we are concerned about only one symptom. Our center of attention is only one symptom, and that is dizziness bar imbalance bar lightheadedness. And the most common electrolyte to cause this problem is sodium, and especially the reduced or the decreased concentration of sodium in the body volume. So I'll be talking more about hypo natremia. And what is hyponatremia? It is less than serum sodium concentration, less than 135 milliequivalents. And why it is important? As I said, the most common disorder that we encounter in our practice as neurotologists and ENT surgeons, that is amounts up to, sorry, how to, Yeah, so this uh, says that around 15 to 30% in hospital setting, especially intensive uh, care units present with hyponatremia. So what are the causes of hyponatremia? There are many causes, but most importantly, it is excessive fluid loss that can happen because of sweating, burns, vomiting, diarrhea, poor nutrition, involvement of uh, liver, heart, or kidney, whereby the fluid balance is affected, or when there is thyroid abnormality or adrenal disorders causing Addison's disease, even those things can present with uh, hyponatremia. So whenever the patient presents with uh, these symptoms or these complaints or involvement of these organs or organ systems, 
you can have one uh, differential diagnosis in your mind, okay, there might be some electrolyte imbalance, you know, that one thing you can keep in mind. But wait, is it so easy? No, hyponatremia is not so simple. There is again something called as true and again something called as pseudo-hyponatremia. So what is pseudo-hyponatremia, translocational hyponatremia? In pseudo, the actual uh, uh, reduction in sodium concentration is not because of the loss of the sodium. It is because of the presence of some other particle in the blood like triglycerides most commonly and plasma proteins. And in case of translocational, presence of osmotically active ingredients like mannitol or glucose. But why do we have to know this? Why do we have to be aware of this? This is because patient gets referred to you and uh, with complaints of imbalance and you see the lab investigations and there is reduction in uh, sodium level. Don't straight away jump, okay, signs and symptoms are secondary to hyponatremia, so kindly replace with sodium. No. Because here it is not because of actual loss of sodium. So if you have to correct the triglyceridemia and correct the uh, uh, protein level in the blood and then the sodium gets corrected itself. So it becomes very important to be aware of these things whether you treat or not treat. True is where there's actual reduction in the uh, sodium levels. Uh, that is, uh, it can be hypovolemic, euvolemic and hypovolemic. So again, there are different causes for these things. So one I would like to stress upon is you have to, you know, uh, see the causes for it. So if the patient is on any diuretics, if there's any mineralocorticoid deficiency or associated with any hypothyroidism or any cardiovascular causes like congestive heart failure. So keeping all these things in mind becomes important so that you have a differential diagnosis when you're a little confused about what to do with the imbalanced patient. So next, how do they present with you? They present, they can present acutely or they can present in a chronic uh, presentation. Acute is when it is less than 48 hours. So when the acute hyponatremia is an emergency which has to be treated immediately, they do not usually present to us because they'll have a lot of neurological symptoms. It might lead to coma and death also. So usually they do not come to us. What we usually come across is a chronic hyponatremia. And mostly chronic hyponatremias are asymptomatic. Sometimes chronic hyponatremia may present with gait uh, instabilities or imbalances and also with orthostatic hypotension. And that is when we have to intervene and treat. So how do you make a diagnosis? So diagnosis mainly depends on history as I already discussed. Take the drug history or whether the patient is on any diuretics or anything like that. Diet, then history of volume loss, C for signs of de dehydration, C for skin turgor, whether uh, the mucous membranes are dry, and also check for postural uh, BP, whether there's any fall in the postural uh, BP. That is also important. That is a determination of volume. Test for adrenal insufficiency, like Addison's disease, again, required for maintenance of fluid uh, balance. Hypothyroidism, lung lesions, and finally, serum electrolytes. So when do you treat them? The treat, not all cases of hyponatremia require treatment. See, uh, you need to treat depending upon the volume uh, status, whether there's any dehydration signs, then you have to jump upon it. Or duration, as I said, acute hyponatremia requires immediate treatment. It's an emergency. Chronic depends on if it's asymptomatic, we do not need to do anything. So whether presence or absence of symptoms direct towards whether it's required or not required. Then etiology of hyponatremia, as I mentioned earlier, what is causing it? Is it multiple myeloma increasing the uh, concentration of uh, uh, plasma proteins in the blood leading to decrease in sodium? Is it hypertriglyceridemia? Etiology is very important before we jump. So that was about the sodium. Now the next electrolyte is magnesium, which is an essential mineral and it is involved in various functions. But why am I talking about magnesium? Because of its link to migraines. Significant research has shown that people with migraine might have lower levels of magnesium. And one study has shown that when you give magnesium regularly, frequency of migraine attacks were reduced by 41%. Other research showed that daily magnesium supplements are effective in treating menstrual cycle related migraine attacks. It's, it, it actually prevents it. So how do you give? Either you can give it orally in the form of magnesium oxide at a dosage of 400 to 500 milligrams per day. 
or in the form of uh, injection that is magnesium sulfate usually magnesium sulfate is given in acute attacks or severe attacks of migraine you can give 1 gram of magnesium sulfate intravenously over 15 minutes or simpler way advise the patient to take it naturally in the food so ask the patient to have a nutritious diet which is much simpler but one thing i would like to mention is magnesium is a much safer uh, uh, drug or uh, supplement to be given so it can be given even in uh, pregnancy and lactation also uh, in case of uh, migraine patients next i didn't know whether i had to include this slide or not anyways i included it vitamin d and uh, bppv we all know bppv is due to dislodgement of the calcium carbonate crystals and there is calcium the electrolyte and vitamin d is uh, required uh, for the absorption of uh, calcium some people say that uh, vitamin d is useful in uh, refractory or recurrent uh, bppv so a study was done and they gave this following uh, postulates one was according to theoretical consideration there exists a link between bppv and vitamin d so given the prevalence of vitamin d deficiency and the ease of giving vitamin d give it anyways whether it works or not give it anyways second since bppv is so common and even if it helps a small percentage of people technically it will be helping a large percentage of people so whether it helps or not give vitamin d that's what the study says i'm not saying then so this is all theoretical now practically how do you identify if dizziness is due to electrolyte imbalance or not now this is out of my personal experience so it it might sound a little crude so if anybody has any other input please uh, put forward so first thing i actually look is where the patient is getting referred from is the patient getting referred from the medicine ward where the patient is admitted with prolonged fever and uh, there is signs of dehydration not drinking enough water or the, whether the patient is admitted for uh, vomiting or diarrhea then that is one sign second is the patient getting uh, referred from the nephrology department with nephrotic syndrome or is patient under dialysis third from the cardiac is the patient uh, a case of congestive heart failure so these are the signs the moment i come to know about the department the patient is referred from the flag goes up okay this might be electrolyte imbalance second the uh, presenting symptoms usually with hyponatremia the patients present with postural imbalance symptoms like when they get up from sitting up position or they get up from lying down position they have a feeling of mostly a light headedness kind of feeling a dizziness kind of a feeling so that is one more indicator third while doing examination when you do the positional examination like dixalpac and roll test you put them in the uh, dixalpac position nothing happens there is no vertigo there is no nystagmus and when the patient sits up they say that they have mild imbalance or light headedness feeling and it will be present bilaterally it will be present on both sides that is one more indicator another is do a postural bp check the bp while lying down and check the bp while standing up so if there is any fall for a significant significant postural hypotension to call it as uh, orthostatic hypotension they say there should be a fall of 20 mm in systolic and 10 mm in diastolic but i have found if there is a fall of 2 mm also so ideally when you stand it should increase so if there is no fall or fall of 2 mm also take it as positive and treat the patient so this is my uh, this thing how to distinguish dizziness whether it's due to electrolyte imbalance or not then how do you generally how do you solve an electrolyte imbalance first one is diet i have to take a proper nutritious diet which includes all the essential electrolytes first step second one sodium intake not more not less especially avoid all the extra salt containing stuff like bakery items biscuits soft drinks all that a big no third water intake again not too much not too little how do you advise take at least 8 to 10 glasses of water or every 3 4 hours the patient should keep passing urine so that is a good water intake ideal water intake again it depends on the diet the physical activity and age also but this is the ideal general one 
Then I, I swear by this also, preambulatory and isometric exercises, whenever a patient uh, uh, presents to you with postural hypertension, these things actually help. So these are the uh, exercises that the patient has to adapt whenever the patient gets up from sitting position or gets up from lying down position, these things help. Either technically or psychologically, they help. Last is, of course, if it is required, supplementation. That is the last thing that you do. So finally, so I would like to conclude by saying it is time to break the glass ceiling, to go beyond, to go ahead. Thank you.